You're listening to a sermon originally recorded by Schweitzer United Methodist Church in Springfield, Missouri. Check us out online at sumc.co. And if this sermon blessed you, be sure to share it with someone else. Thank you so much for listening. Now, on to the message. morning. My name is Jake Hotchkiss. I'm an associate pastor here at Schweitzer. Uh, Good to be here. We are in the last week of our series called Be Part of This. And uh, if you've missed any of this time, basically our goal in this series has been to talk about the, the kind of church we believe God has called us to be. There are five things in particular that God has laid on our hearts. Uh, community impact, to get outside of these walls and, and change the community around us. Uh, deeper discipleship, which we're going to talk about today. Caring hearts, engaging worship. I know I'm missing one. It's in there somewhere. Uh, go to our website, be.sumc.co. You can find that in the bulletin. If you go there, I want you, please, if you, if you just want to see what's going on at Schweitzer, if you want to celebrate with us, if you want to be a part of it, then, then go there um, and, and check it out. To everyone who is a part of this community, um, as we wrap up this series, I just want to say thank you. Uh, Schweitzer, if you don't know my story, Schweitzer is pivotal in my story. Um, I would not be who I am or where I am today if it weren't for this community, um, which means many, if not all of you, in one way or another. So this is just a great place to be, and I praise God for making Schweitzer who we are. Deeper discipleship is what we're going to talk about today. This is close to our hearts, near and dear to us here at Schweitzer. What does that mean? It means that we believe that too many Christians stop running before the race is over. Too many Christians stop running before the race is over. In other words, the life of discipleship is one that is constantly calling us deeper. Did you hear that? The life of discipleship is one that is constantly calling us deeper, further up and further in. That's what it means to follow Jesus. It means that no matter how deep you've gone, no matter how far you've gone, no matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how old you are or how young you are, there is more to be had. God promises us that. There is more, more love to receive, more love to give, more intimacy to have with God, more more power and strength to have in his presence. I mean, you could go on and on, further up and further in, no matter where you're at in your life, that is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Will you say that with me? Further up and further in. Go. Further up and further in. I love this analogy um, of, imagine a stairway to heaven, okay? Heaven being the presence of God. Now imagine instead of a stairway, it being an escalator. Instead of just an escalator going up, it's an escalator that's going down. Remember as a kid, you always wanted to run up the downwards escalator? I still want to do that. So imagine that, that, that escalator to heaven, but it's, it's going down. There are always things that are working against us in the life of faith. There are always There's always a stream, kind of a current that we've got to fight against in order to to grow in our relationship with God, in order to go deeper. And there's, there's one of three things that we can do on this escalator, if you will, in this life of faith. The first is this. We can stop. I've seen and heard too many stories of where Christians stop. They're on fire when they first come to faith in Jesus Christ, and they're moving, and they're moving, and at some point in their life, they just stop moving. And what happens when you stop on an escalator that's going downwards? You actually move backwards. You see, this is counterintuitive. We tend to think that, well, I made it this far in my faith, in my walk with Jesus. And since I made it that far, 20 or 30 years from now, I'm still going to be that close to God. That's not true. 
So you actually get further and further away, further out. The second thing you can do is you can remain consistent in your pace. You can develop spiritual rhythms, spiritual disciplines, a way of life that keeps you in place. You see, so even if you're consistent, even if you're walking with a sort of rhythm, what happens on that escalator is you're still not going further up and further in. You're remaining in place, and that's not a bad thing. There are seasons where that's what we do, and Jesus stays right there with us, and he nurtures our faith, all right? But it requires movement and dedication and consistency, even just to stay in the same kind of relationship with God that you had in the past. That's profound, isn't it? And then there are seasons where Jesus, he paves the way ahead of us. He, he makes space for more growth. He walks out just a little ahead of us and he says, come on, follow me. Let's go deeper. Let's go further up and further in. And so this morning we're going to talk about going deeper. And there are a few key elements to going deeper that after this sermon... I hope you will remember for the rest of your life. Because it's hard. This going deeper is hard. It always requires something of us. It always requires a little bit of extra effort that's not just walking in place, right? So let's get going. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to read a lot of scripture, this, almost this whole chapter. We're going to start in verse 2, and I'll break it up in a few pieces, okay? Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, Watch out for those dogs those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. You hear that? No confidence in human effort. Though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. Well, well, We'll recap all of this, so don't worry if you're not understanding. He says, Paul speaking of himself, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, he says, I obeyed the law without fault. That's a bold statement. I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else, everything that I had is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Now, let's recap what Paul is saying here. You got to know that Christianity is a continuation of uh, or, or the fulfillment even of the Jewish faith. You know that, right? Jesus of Nazareth was a Jew. He was circumcised at eight days old. He preached and he taught the Old Testament scriptures. He, he worshiped the God they called Yahweh. And most of his earliest followers were Jewish people that realized that Jesus was, was the Messiah they've been looking forward to for forever, all right? So, but, but now, after Jesus' resurrection and in the decades after where, where Paul is writing, this church in Philippi, across the Mediterranean and across the Middle East and everywhere, there are new people, non-Jews, that are coming to faith, who are beginning to worship the God of, of the Old Testament, the God of the Jews, right? And this is, this is kind of a new thing for the Jewish people. And so they've got to learn uh, all of these, these elements of the Jewish faith and all of these uh, prophecies that the Old Testament fulfilled, and etc. But you've, here's what was happening. is all of the old Jews, all the people who were raised in that tradition, we're going to these, these new Jews, or the, the new Christians, and saying, you got to be circumcised. Don't you see? Because they understood that circumcision was, was the mark of the covenant. It, they're saying, if you want to be in a covenant relationship with God, you need to be circumcised. This is what the Jewish law says. This is what the Old Testament says. 
oh, and by the way, you've got to obey all of the Jewish laws and you've got to go to the temple and offer sacrifices in the way that we've been doing for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? So they were telling all of these new Christians, they were, they were imposing all of their Jewish laws on these new Christians. And what, what Paul was saying is they're wrong. Don't listen to them. That may or may not be what the Old Testament told them to do, they're, but, but they don't get it. We live in a new age. Do not listen to them. Now, now look. I don't think that we have the same problem of Jews coming and telling us that we need to be circumcised in order to be saved today. But we live, we, we, there is a, a parallel in our culture. Let me make this a little bit more clear. Let's talk about baptism for a minute. Uh, Andrew Smitherman was just baptized. Just a beautiful moment. I think this will help. This, this will help us to understand what I'm getting at. Um, Baptizes an infant, similar to circumcision, actually, actually, there's a lot of parallels between baptism and circumcision. Um, but when Andrew grows up, it is very likely that he will want to be rebaptized as an adult. Many of you in this room have been rebaptized, right? And hear this he should not be rebaptized as an adult. We have an enemy. We have an enemy that wants us to believe that salvation is conditional upon things other than just our faith. Does that make sense? We, we have an enemy that wants us to believe that faith plus X, Y, Z equals salvation. And what Paul is saying is no. We put no confidence in human effort. Not in circumcision, not in getting baptized again because I fell away from the faith, not in praying the right prayer, not, not in any of these things, right? No confidence in human effort. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done alone. And let me, let me tell you this. It takes more faith after falling away from God to say, you know what? I was baptized. I believe in what Christ has done for me and that I am saved, and that I don't need to be rebaptized. It takes more faith to make that statement than it does to say, I need to be rebaptized. I need to give myself back to God and earn my way back into his covenant relationship. Do you get what I'm saying? Do you see the parallel there? We have an enemy that wants us to believe all of these things. Yes, Jesus did that for you. Put your faith in him, but then plus do all of these things so you can have confidence that you are saved. And what Paul is saying is have confidence that you are saved. We who worship by the Spirit, we are truly circumcised. We are truly baptized. We are saved. Martin Luther was, for years in his life, just uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> uh, he, he was incredibly hard on himself. There's a better word, I can't think of it. But, but he would punish himself physically for sinning. I mean, he was just this. Um, and he had this moment or this season of, of, of grace where he finally realized the gospel. And for the rest of his life, Martin Luther, of course, began the Protestant Reformation. But uh, where for the rest of his life, he would tell himself, I am baptized. They say he had it written in chalk on his desk uh, in, in Latin, like baptizatus sum was the phrase, which means I am baptized. And anytime he was tempted or anytime he doubted his salvation or anytime he faced a struggle in his faith, he would declare, I am baptized. This isn't just something that happened to me in the past. This is a state of being right now. I am a child of God because I believe that Christ has done it. Got it? So I want you all to say with me right now, if you've been baptized, say, I am baptized. Ready? I am baptized. It's not just something that happened once, and if it happened, you never have to do it again. You are. There is no other condition than that you have faith in what Jesus Christ has already done. And this changes everything. You don't have to say the perfect prayer. You don't have to believe all the right things. You don't have to live a perfect life. You don't have to feel him in your heart in just the right way. You don't have to speak in tongues, and you don't have to get rebaptized. I could go on. The only criteria is that you rely on what Christ has done for you. Put your confidence there, okay? Or else you'll get nowhere in the life of faith. 
You'll strive and you'll strive and you'll try and you'll run hard and you'll realize at the, end of the, at the end of the race, you were running the wrong race the whole time. And isn't this just incredibly comforting and empowering? That no matter where you're at on your faith journey, no matter where you're at throughout the process of salvation, you are saved. God has you, right? God has you. And he has promised to take you the distance. And then further, we can stop comparing ourselves to one another. Because we're on equal ground. Not a single one of us deserves it any more than anyone else. Or any less than anyone else. We're all on equal ground. Running the same race by the same grace. I just made that up on the spot. How was that? It just came out. I don't know. Uh, okay. So number one is that rely on what Christ has done. Don't forget that. Rely on what Christ has done. Let's read on, verses 10 through 16. Paul says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. What he's talking about is the kind of the, the, the final resurrection of the Christian faith. We all believe that we will be raised in new bodies, that all of creation will be fully transformed, that we and all things will be made perfect, right? That's what he's looking forward to. And he says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things, okay? Or that I have already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. That is a beautiful phrase. I'm going to read that again. I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. There's this idea that, that Christ accepted me before I was even acceptable, right? And yet, he doesn't want to leave me the way that I am. He possessed me in order that. He, he took hold of my life in order that he could transform me and make me perfect, right? And so I reach towards that goal knowing that he's got me the whole way, all right? He says, no, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Now, I, I love this phrase, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. It's the second thing I want you to remember is that if you want to get anywhere in the life of faith, you have to forget what you have and haven't done. First thing is you've got, you got to rely on what Christ has done, but the second thing is forget what you have or haven't done. Forget it. What's in your past? For many of us, it's uh, time wasted. You know what I mean? Maybe you're in your teens or 20s, maybe you're in your 70s and you're thinking, I just came to faith. I've got, you know, I'm, I'm closer to death than I am not. And I'm just, I, I've not given myself to God as holy as I, think, as I should have, um, or I've not given myself to my family or I've not, you know what I mean? Just time wasted. And we look at that and we just kind of crumble. I mean, we're overwhelmed with all this time that we wasted. And it, but it's in the past. Forget it. See, because time that, that we've wasted, God has had a plan for the whole time. I mean, God is going to make good with that time. We don't worry. We press on to the upward call of Christ Jesus. What else is in your past? Mistakes made. Sins committed. And we think, man, how am I ever going to dig myself out of this hole? How am I ever going to earn God's love again? You see, it's, it's an act of faith. It is an act of, of great faith. To forget your past, forget it. Forget five minutes ago, forget five years ago. And just look forward. It's incredibly freeing. For some of us, the barriers in our past are our accomplishments. For some of us, we look to our past and we say, I've done all of these things in the life of faith. I'm a preacher now. I've, that's, an, I'm an, that's an accomplishment. I've gotten this far, and I could settle and be good with that. You know what I mean? 
I've served in this way. I've gone, I've been a missionary in this country. I've done, you know what I mean? I, I've accomplished all of these things in the faith, and I've gone further than, uh, you know, these people in my life when I'm comparing myself. And so I, I could just settle. We can, we can do that when we focus on the past. We've got to forget the past and look, look forward to what lies ahead. And then he says, let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. I love that phrase, spiritually mature. There are two people who come to mind when I think spiritually mature. Um, one is Bob Casty, our lead pastor. He's been my mentor now for a few years. Um, and then the other is my wife's mentor, Linda Harper. Um, and they both kind of work together on a team to, to lead our spiritual guide ministry. Anyway, um, they're old, all right? And uh, they, <laughs> they're old, and, they're, and they're, they're spiritually mature, though. Like, they're some of the, the godliest people I know. They just love Jesus, unlike most of the people I know. And one of the marks of that love for Jesus, and one of the things that blows me away about their life is that they are in the latter stages of their life, and they've gone so much further in the life of faith than I have, and yet they're still pressing deeper. That's just incredible. I mean, Bob just spent two years going to school to learn how to be a spiritual director and like learn, I mean, really deep stuff, a new realm of, of his spiritual life that he's getting into. And then he's leading others in the way too, right? I mean, that's, he's still learning. And, and just every day, every week, you just, you can feel the longing in his spirit to experience more of God. Linda's the same way. She just got accepted in, into a school. And she's, she doesn't even work for the church. She's retired, and she just got accepted into this, this I think it's a couple-year-long program to continue growing in her faith, too, and then so she can share that with others. And there's just this, man, I think too often in the spiritual life, new Christians are more spiritually alive or, or filled with the Spirit than old Christians, right? And that's sad. The fact that people that, you know, are on fire for God, or it's the beginning of their faith, and we just say, oh, that's just naive. They're in the easy part of their faith. And then the old Christians are just the, you know, they kind of look the same. They've lost, they're lackluster. They've lost the fire. And that's not how it should be. And I, I, I'm a living witness to people whose lives say that isn't how it needs to be. That flame doesn't need to be put out, but it can just grow and grow and grow and grow. And so that's what spiritual maturity can and should look like. So forget what you have or haven't done. Look forward to what lies ahead. Press on. Then the last point we're going to read here is in verse 17. Dear brothers and sisters, Paul writes, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. Pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. People like Bob, people like Linda. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct show they are really enemies of the cross. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. Their God is their appetite. Doesn't that describe our culture, consumerism? They brag about shameful things. They think only about this life here on earth. That explains my life all too often. They think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown I receive for my work. In other words, there's a distinction between people who follow Christ, who really follow Christ, and people who don't. And unfortunately, that distinction even exists within our church, but it's true, you know. There are those who call themselves Christians who are really following Christ, and there are people who call themselves Christians who aren't. Find those people who are. It's as simple as that. And I'm telling you, it's not just my own personal experience. And every other Christian I know who's, who's gone anywhere in their faith is that they have found the leadership of someone who is really following Christ, who thinks less about the things of this world than they do about the things of heaven. 
and who gives himself fully to God. Find those people. There are ways here at Schweitzer where you can do that. I'm going to lift them up really quickly. If we could throw up our discipleship model. Um, yeah. Classes, groups, bands, mentors, okay? I want you to listen to this. Um, these are all places here at Schweitzer where you can make this happen, where there are people who are spiritually mature, who you can begin to be in a relationship with and to grow in your faith. The first class, there are a couple that were lifted up today. In January, there's one big one. It's called the Bible Made Simple. January 16th, the Bible Made Simple. This is going to be a big class. We've got an awesome teacher for this class that you guys are just going to love. And anyone, anywhere in their faith can join this class and start to build relationships, grow in their knowledge of Scripture, and go deeper in the life of faith. That's happening in January. Groups. There's a group opportunity called The Living Room in January. Uh, It's a four-week trial period where you can learn what it's like to be in a small group and to be in Christian community, again, with other people who are really doing this thing. Okay? Okay. and that'll take place. Both of those start January 16th. And the signups will be in the next few weeks. You'll see them. Um, bands, we won't talk about those today. Um, mentors, there's a specific kind of mentor called a spiritual guide. Bob and Linda are the two uh, lead spiritual guides. And they've got a whole team of people that are ready for a one-on-one relationship with you, if you need this, to grow in your faith. Where you meet with them, I think, once a month, and they help you to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It's just an incredible ministry. ministry. Um, and every spiritual guide um, is farther along than you in your faith, if you choose to do that, right? I mean, it's just in, to develop a relationship like that with someone, man, it's worth it. So if you want to be, uh, if you want a spiritual guide, then you can contact Bob, and you can find his, his email online, okay? So there's three things that we talked about in order to press on, to go further up and further in. The first is rely on what Christ has done, okay? Forget what you have or haven't done, forget it, and imitate those who follow Christ. Pretty simple, right? That's all I got this morning. If the band would come up, I'd like us to just pray. And you can pray with your eyes open with me. Um, You can pray with your eyes shut, whatever you need. But I just want to give some space for God to kind of speak to each of us. Lord, we recognize that you're in this space and uh, that you are calling us all deeper. My prayer is for each one of us um, that you can help us to really rely on what you have done. It's easier said than done. God, would you help us to know the love of Christ, to have faith in the love of Christ? Would you help us to have so much faith that we really can forget our past and just start fresh, just right here, right now, and move forward? trusting that you've got us, not fearing and and not doubting our salvation, but just knowing, (coughs) walking with you step by step. (coughs) Take a moment now to just sit and listen to God. Just ask God, God, is there anything you want from me? God, is there anything you want from me? God loves you. God is pleased with you. He accepts you. There's nothing to be afraid of. So God, we give ourselves to you. In the name of Jesus, amen.